And the Lord, <laughs> the Lord showed me something recently when I went to the mountain. Logically, I thought, well, I've been, I've been invited to Moravian Falls to go to Prayer Mountain. So logically, well, why do I need to go to North Carolina? Why do I need to go to North Carolina? Some people are like down the road and God's saying, go to the rock. And they're like, I'm not doing that. I don't know those people. God says, go to Moravian Falls. I'm like, oh, okay. It's not part of my plan. Now I got to buy a plane ticket. And it's like, that's, that's not a part of my budget. And the Lord's like, that's not how your budget is determined. <laughs> Some of us are trying to figure out how to have breakthrough. And you know, he's setting up breakthroughs. He's giving us tests so that he can graduate us. And you can never graduate without passing a test. If I pass the test out, if I was the teacher and we, this was a classroom and I passed out the test and you received the test, that doesn't give you breakthrough itself. You actually have to respond to what the Lord is asking. But if you don't respond, no one else loses except you. See, we got to get a hold of this revelation because I believe God is positioning everybody here to move into a corporate breakthrough together. And so many of you are going to have such ridiculous breakthroughs in this place that people around you are going to start asking you questions on how did it happen for you. And many of you will just simply respond, well, I just did what God said. And some of you will be like trying to figure out how you could position and posture and manipulate God, and it doesn't work. And others will just say, well, God, whatever you say, I'll do it. And he'll ask you, and you'll hear clearly because you've already decided that you want to do his will. See, wanting to do what he says comes out of knowing his plans are good, so you don't ever want to forget that his plans are good and that they're made. If you don't think his plans are made, then you will try to make your own plan, and sometimes we get into rebellion doing it that way. I sometimes think, well, what's logical? It's not logical for me to go to Moravian Falls. This isn't really a good time, Lord. I didn't actually say that. I just said yes. But I'm just trying to imagine if I was a rebellious type. But I do have to say that there was a time where I was a very rebellious type. And I know I still miss it, but I just have to say this because I was walking through life as the Lord of me, and I had a fish sticker. I was telling people I was a Christian, but I wasn't following him. I was going to church consistently, and even sometimes I would give, but he didn't have my heart. I was talking the talk and quoting the scripture because I had learned it, but my heart was not his. Is anybody identifying with this? <laughs> Three of you are getting real. <laughs> I quoted this scripture really good. I would even rattle it off to impress people because I thought, well, for sure, if I can quote the whole thing. And they're sitting there, okay, I know that scripture too. Are you done yet? But, I, I mean, you know, sometimes we'll do this, right? It's religious. So we, we feel better about ourselves or something. But it's not about how much you know. It's about who you know. And when you know Jesus, then you know what to say and you know what to do. It's so fun. Isn't it fun? It really is an adventure. So, anyway, I met this guy when I was at Reinhardt Bonnke School of Evangelism. Uh, Daniel Kalenda is a, a friend. You, some of you watched that interview. He flew me out to uh, Christ for All Nations for interviews with uh, God TV show. Some of you knew about that. And did anybody see that, by the way? Anybody see it? Some of you saw it. Okay, if you didn't see it, it's on my, I put it on my Facebook, Nathan French Ministries. But um, what God showed me was, he showed me that he was trying to direct me into great breakthroughs and great victories. But in order for me to get there, I would have to keep saying yes. And if I was going to hear clearly his voice, I would have to determine in advance that whatever he asked was a good thing. And so when he said, I want you to go, I went. And I've been tracking this because I'm trying to learn from my, my past. 
and not to condemn myself or to look back, but to learn so I can grow for the, for the next thing that God's going to do. And so how many people know, like, he's shaping us, molding us as the perfector? You know, per -per perfector actually is give or of perfection. So perfection doesn't just happen. You don't just come out of the womb and go, hey, man, let's have a T-bone steak. I'd like it to be rare, please. No, you come out whining and crying. <laughs> I need something. Me, me, me. But after a while, we, you know, we get milk as, as believers, and then we start to move from meat, from milk to meat. And Jesus is like, hey, I want to give you something that will sustain you for longer today. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> so anyway, this guy calls me. He's like, hey, uh, I felt like God told me I'm supposed to invite you to come out to Moravian Falls. I'm like, well, where's that? He's like, it's up in, uh, uh, where is it, North Carolina. And I'm like, Huh, you know, that's, I haven't actually ever been there before. He goes, yeah, they've been praying like night and day for a hundred years, and the heavens are just open as a result of the prayers. And I'm thinking, well, that sounds pretty good, because I'm, I'm trying to logically figure out why I need to go to Moravian Falls when I'm in Gig Harbor. Gig Harbor? I can be where I'm at, and it doesn't cost me. Some of you are trying to figure out how you can get where God wants you to go without it costing you. It does not work. Take it from my own failure. I tried fighting God. I, I wanted to die. I was hooked up to my exhaust pipe. A seconds from death, my van ran out of gas. Hello, I'm here today because my van ran out of gas. I had a black garbage bag over my head. Pretty cool, huh? Pretty glamorous. I thought I was smarter than God, and that's where I ended up, right there. So I learned a few things. Like, one, that's not good to do it my way. But God's plan is good, and it's made, and it's to prosper me. So I think God's going to do something powerful. And the, the revelation is meant to unlock something that what Jesus did, he will do again in the life of another. And there's a lot of scripture woven into this story. But when I, when I uh, said yes to the Lord, actually, I didn't want to, I, I have to be honest, I didn't really want to go to Moravian Falls. Do you know why? Because I didn't have a plan to go there. And this guy's telling me he heard God. This is Daniel Kalenda's uh, former assistant who now has his own ministry and does crusades around the world. And I thought, well, that'd be cool, you know, to go and maybe, maybe God will do something and maybe I need him to do something. And I started thinking it through and, and I just said, well, Lord... I don't know why I'm thinking, you know, about, you know, what's in it for me or what will I benefit from going or or is it, you know, what's, you know, the carnal part of mankind. Right. And I just said, Lord, do you want me to go? Because I know I can pray from right here and stuff will happen. And you know what? He said, yeah, I want you to go. I asked him to call you. I asked him to call you. You know, he only asked five people. Well, four besides himself, four. And two of the four came. And, and we, w we went to that place. We went to this private place up there in the mountains. And, and uh, we had this cabin on the river. It was just really glorious. And, and a lot of great men and women of the faith had gone there uh, to be at this place for, for just times of prayer and refreshing in the Lord. And, and uh, anytime you get, get away from the noise and the routine, and just get in the presence of God, things begin to unlock, and he begins to speak to us, and shape, and mold, and prod, and poke, and deliver, and heal, and transform, and then we start thinking like he thinks, and it's good. So I'm in this place, and I'm just like, well, here, here we are, you know, and, and the Lord tells me, call Terry, this guy I used to hang out with like seven years ago. He used to live in our city, and, and Terry, and uh, John knows him, and I was like, um, call Terry. God just says, call Terry. <laughs> I don't think, did I tell you this, John? I didn't tell you this? Yeah, so the Lord tells me, call Terry. So I call Terry, and I'm like, hey, Terry, uh, God spoke to me and told me I'm supposed to tell you that I'll be in Moravian Falls uh, in, in, um, in North Carolina, uh, like, next week. And he goes, really? Well, did you know I'm moving to Moravian Falls? I mean, the only one person I called to obey the Lord and tell him that I'm moving, I'm going there. And he goes, well, did you know I'm moving there? I'm like, what? No, of course I didn't know that. He goes, well, well, that's funny. God told you to call me. We haven't talked in all these years. 
And I go, yeah, he told me to, to tell you I was going to be there. And maybe, I, I don't know if you're going to be anywhere, anywhere near that. He goes, well, you know, I've been living in, in the Midwest, but I'm moving next week to Moravian Falls. And so I'm, I'm, what date are you going to be there? And he just literally was moving like the day before I arrive. This is an amazing man of God. I love Terry, you know. And so I call him Prophet Terry, but he would never say he's a prophet. But I just call him Prophet Terry. Sometimes I'll joke with him. I'll hit him on the arm and I'll go, what does it profit a man? Anyway, so. You know, I call Terry. He's like, I'll just have arrived. He goes, I'm excited to see you. So anyway, I go up there. We're just driving through the woods. And like I'm going past like, you know, this Morning Star Ministries. Anybody heard of uh, Morning Star? Yeah. So we're going up there and they kind of own the portion of land on the top of the mountain where Bob Jones. You guys remember the prophet Bob Jones? Yeah. Pro- prophet Bob Jones. He had all these experiences on the mountain, you know, well, all these years, 100 years of prayer. There's heavens are wide open because the prayer opens up heaven. Why? Because when we're talking to God, it's like portals form. And then the angels come in and out through those conversations. That's why you feel the increased manifestation of God's presence known as the glory. And when he said, I'll take you from glory to glory, he's saying, I'll increase my manifested presence on you, in you and through you. And the result of that manifested presence will be that healings and miracles will take place and people will get saved and healed and delivered because of me. That's the Lord. I mean, he just wants to use everyone so you can actually learn to get saturated by the presence and the power of God. Uh, so, so anyway, I'm just going to tell you a few, just a few stories and I want to go right into the word, but a lot of this is just scripture in another way without chapter and verse, but this is so powerful what God did. So I get there and I'm like, Lord, well, I'm here. Now what do you want to do? And the Lord says, I just want you to encounter me. So I pull out my journal. You know, I love pulling out the journal because he taught me that if I pull out my journal to listen to his voice, that that's an act of faith and he's a rewarder of faith. Some people are trying to hear God, but they're not really even asking any questions. (laughs) If you want to talk to me, ask me a question once in a while. Some people come up, they call me up on the phone. They're just like, bop, 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 And after 10 minutes, I'm like, so how are you doing? <laughs> Don't you wonder if God's like going, come on, ask me a question. I want to teach you. But if you know everything, you can't be taught, right? So the Lord told me, he says, Nathan, I just want you to humble yourself so that you can pray. Well, we know 2 Chronicles 7, 14 says, if... That's if we do something, he'll do something. If we humble ourselves. Do you know it took a humbling of myself to go to Moravian Falls? Because logically it didn't make any sense. Well, I'm not going all the way to North Carolina. I don't have a speaking engagement. See, when I go, because I'm speaking somewhere, I have a reason to go there besides just to go pray because I could pray from here. You see why logically it doesn't make sense to do that? So I could easily justify my rebellion by deciding that my plan's better than God, and that's what we do. Oftentimes, this is what we're doing. We're saying, Lord, have your way. And then he says, okay, do this. And you're like, oh, I'm not doing that. (laughs) Oh, Lord, you're the Lord of all. I get out of the throne place so you can sit down. Okay, beloved, just come to me. Well, I don't have time for that. I got to work. I just feel like he's crying out right now in this hour. I long to gather my children. I long to gather you like a mother hen would gather her chicks. But you will not come. See, he's crying out, will you come to me? You who are burdened and weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And you will find rest for your soul. I didn't even know I needed rest. But when I got up there and I heard the sound of that river, I was just like, "Woo, glory. Oh, Jesus. I started crying out, Jesus. All creation is groaning for the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. I worship you. You are good. You brought me out here in the mountains, and I like mountains. What do you want to say to me, Lord? And you know what? He started speaking to me. It was so amazing. One, one thing I love about God is he never runs out of things to, to say to inspire us. 
He wants to encourage us, exhort us, fill us, restore us, redeem us. It's just so good, right? So I'm sitting there with the Lord and I'm asking questions and he's speaking to me. You know, I just go, uh, Bobby Connor was telling a, a story. He stayed in that same cabin. So somehow I get connected to a very private, secluded community just down from the mountaintop. And you'd never be able to find this place for one thing if you didn't know somebody. Like it was just like kind of off and back and in the woods and tucked in. And there's this little cabin down on the river. It's like an obscure little cabin down on the river. I'm <laughs> just like, here we are, you know. There's lightning bugs. It's wild. It's like there's these little lights, and they just fly around. Anybody ever seen those before? Oh, that, for, for me, it was like the first time. So I was just like, wow, look at that. You know, there he goes. And, you know, you look up. Yeah, they're like that. That's like, it's like that. <laughs> it was amazing. And so I'm just looking at these lightning bugs, and I'm like, wow, the lightning bugs, and then the stars, and the trees, and the wind, and the river. It was just like, woo, bliss. I felt like I got a kiss from heaven. <laughs> I was in the bliss of the kiss from heaven. And I mean, I'm listening to the sound of that river just flowing, and those lightning bugs are flying, and the stars are just shining, and I'm just like, wow. Wow. <sighs> Well, my phone didn't work. So if you tried to call me, I'm not being mean. I just didn't know my phone was ringing. But man, was it good to have it not ringing. My phone rings a lot. You guys don't know. People call me pastor from all over the nations. Because you go somewhere and you love people and you, you, you pour into them and, and they see you as pastor. And then they start calling you pastor and then they, they start phoning you and texting you and sending you private messages about their crises. And I'd love to get to all of them, but I'm just one guy. But some of them get mad, and they, they don't know. They don't know how busy we get. So you know what? Here's the deal. If you try to reach me and I don't answer, it's not because I don't like you. I just want to make sure that little disclaimer is in there. <laughs> and some of you, if you're a pretty lady, I don't answer on purpose. Okay, so just, you know, wait till Sunday. I have to guard myself. <laughs> But I just know this, but when I got up there in the mountains and I started listening to Bobby Connor telling a story about when he stayed in that same cabin. And I thought, I wonder what room he stayed in. And I, I found out he was in the room that I was staying in. And then he was telling a story about when Jesus came and knocked on the door of the cabin. Jesus came. And Bobby's sitting there and he's just praying and there's a knock on the door, like a physical knock on the door. And he comes and he answers the door and Jesus is standing there. And he comes in and he has this bottle of wine. And he goes into the back room where Bobby was staying and smashed it against the, the wall and broke the wine. And Bobby said the fragrance of God just filled the whole place. And I'm just like, what? I mean, I've had encounters with God, but usually like when I see Jesus, I see him in the spirit. I don't see him like walking in physically and all that. And so, hey, if that's available, I receive it in Jesus name. So I'm in there and I'm like, I'm looking through the storybook and there's all these testimonies of encounters that people have been having in Moravian Falls. And this is a place they don't advertise. You have to find it because somebody knows somebody. And I'm looking in there, and I, I mean, I see that there's people that I know, friends that have gone before that have stayed there. But I was sitting there going, wow, God, I want an encounter like that. And the last day, I'm just going to go to the last days because we had a lot of encounters. And then I'm going to share some more word. But this was amazing. So the last day, I'm laying on my bed, and I know we got to pack up. And I'm like, Lord, I heard from you on the mountain. I prayed. We followed the spirit and went to Bob Jones grave. And we found Bob Jones grave site. And it was at this place called the gathering place. And there was like this little house out there. And the Lord said, go over and knock on that door. So we go over and knock on the door. And there was two people in the house and they came out on the porch and I began to prophesy. I felt the Lord told me to knock on your door. And I, I'm sorry if it's not maybe a good timing, but I felt like God had a word for you. 
And if it's okay, I'd just like to share with you what I believe he said. And they're like, okay, yeah, let's hear it. So I prophesy over them and, and then I prophesy over the woman and she's weeping. And, and, and then like, it was just awesome. And then they start prophesying over us. And then the lady who was weeping, she's like, you're a pathfinder. You are known in heaven as a pathfinder. And I'm like, me? She goes, yeah, you're not just a pathfinder. You're a trailblazer. I'm like, I receive it, you know. And then she looks at the other guys and says, you're the navigator. He's the pathfinder and the trailblazer. And you, and she starts prophesying over Pascal. And, and, and Pascal's from France, and he's amazing. He's, he, he'll come here and minister. We're going to do some events together and big stuff. But anyway, you guys will meet him. He's amazing. I got invited to uh, preach at his church in Paris. Um, but... But anyway, so Pascal is, you know, just he's beside himself. And then I go, hey, we got to go over into that church right there. And the lady goes, well, over there, they're doing a prayer meeting. But there's only like three cars, so it doesn't look like anything's going on. But the lady's like, you guys should go if you guys want to go pray. They're in there right now. Just go around to the left. So now, because we followed the Spirit to go to this door, now that door opened. So now we find ourselves in a prayer meeting, and they receive us with gladness, and they begin to pray over us. We prophesied, and we prayed over each other for hours, and we begin to encounter the living God. It was so mutually edifying that we all left there just shining like the sun. And just as I was walking out of the door, I saw a little sign that said, Robert Slairdon is going to be speaking the night before next. And I realize we're going to be here still. And the book of the generals, anybody heard of that? The book of the generals, all those volumes of the great men and women of God, the pioneers in the faith, all recorded in that, in that series of books. His first book, I think it sold 17 million copies. If you haven't read it, it might be a little dry because there's a lot of facts. But some of it's like, what? Smith Wigglesworth went in and messed up a funeral. The guy was in there, and they were all mourning. He grabbed the dead body out of the casket, pulled him out, threw him against the wall, and the guy came back to life. And I'm just like, this is amazing. Like, Jesus really is the resurrection and the life. Like, you read about it, and you go, oh, man, God really did something, but that really is hard for my faith to get my head around and all that. But God's like, oh, no, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I know I can raise the dead. I just haven't found any dead people yet. But when I do, I'm not going to stop and go, oh, well, they're just gone now. I'm going to go, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Come on, man. If you know it happens, then you know it'll happen again, and why not you? Nothing's impossible for those who believe, and everything is possible. And so anyway, I was just like really enjoying the fact that I just found out that there's a general in the faith that's a pioneer that has charted and documented the stories of Oral Roberts and Billy Graham when he was a little boy, and just all these different people who had pioneered over the years. And so I find out he's going to be speaking as I'm walking out, I see this little flyer like they weren't very good at advertising this thing. But it doesn't matter because we got to go and it was amazing. But the thing that was so cool is we got back to our room after we had that time of prayer. And we just went into seeking the face of God. We were listening for the Lord and just having quiet time. And man, we got blasted. Like Jesus came in that place and we were on the floor and we couldn't move and it didn't look normal. I was on the floor laughing, like face down, and I could not get up. It would have been weird to try to fight to stand, so I stayed down. When Pentecost had fully come, they couldn't get up. They were all down on the ground. Some of you are like, I'm not going down. Usually you're the first to go. <laughs> Boop, and then when you go down, everybody's like, whoa, that's what, oh, whoa, whoa, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, you might as well just get ready. <laughs> might as well get ready because that's about to happen. You know, and we've seen it, but it's not like we're trying to get it to happen. It's just the result of what happens when you're so surrendered. Unless we lose our life, we don't find it. Those who find their life will lose it. Those who lose their life will find it. That's the word of God. When you're so surrendered and submitted to the Lord and pressed in with hunger and diligence, you begin to seek the face of God. And all of a sudden, everything gets rearranged. And it doesn't look like what you might expect. This guy, Pascal, I mean, we prayed and we got words and we prophesied over each other in that cabin on the river. And the more we spoke words of edification, the more built up and the more full of faith that we got. And pretty soon we were just on the floor and couldn't move. I got pictures of it. One of the, one of the guys took pictures and took some video. I'm like, dude, don't post that on Facebook. 
No, not that. <laughs> Pascal, he's a Frenchman, and he just loves Jesus. And he's pedaling on a, like he's on a bicycle, but he's on the ground. He's just like, ah! <laughs> he's kicking his legs. Oh, my goodness. Some of you are like, not me. That ain't happening. <laughs> You'll probably be the first one to get whacked by the Holy Ghost. No, Jesus wants to touch us. What would happen if we didn't care what it looked like? I've seen the glory come so thick that people just start shaking like this, and they're not trying to shake. I know there's people that do it like to get attention, but here's the deal. Like, when the Spirit touches you as His holy vessel, your physical body can hardly stand it because you're in the, in the natural realm. So you got the emergence of two realms, the realm of the spirit and the, the tangible uh, physical nature of your being. And those two realms, when they collide, things happen. People fall over. <laughs> Why, Pastor? Well, because they can't stand up. <laughs> I mean, you know, have you ever been walking and just like, whoa, I feel God? That's the best feeling ever. Do you know, so I've noticed if I'm in the will of God, I experience his presence. But even when I'm not really feeling anything, that doesn't mean he left. Some of us think he left because we're not feeling it. Well, feelings are fickle and we cannot trust them. We don't put our trust in how we feel because feelings come and go. They bounce around. So don't do things based on your feelings. But there is a feeling. There is an experiential feeling that encounter brings. And we need to be able to be positioned in our thinking to submit to the Spirit in such a way that it doesn't matter what it looks. They used to put buns in their hair, the ladies in the South, and they would hit the ground and the Holy Ghost would pour out on them and they'd start rolling. They called them holy rollers and their buns would come out and they'd be like, blah! <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like, what if it didn't look like you thought? What if your makeup gets blurred, right? Some of you guys, you might pop a button off your shirt. Well, don't freak out if you lose a button because God could change your life. <laughs> I remember Daddy Hagen. You guys, anybody watch Daddy Hagen? Yeah, he'd walk around and he'd just look at people like this. He'd walk around and he'd look at them. And he'd go, psh, psh, psh. <laughs> People just fall out. They just couldn't get up. You know, one time he tried to close a meeting. He was going for like five hours because nobody wanted to leave the presence. It was too good. There's new wine available, but it's not for everyone. It's for the ones who want to taste. If you just want a religious service, this is not the right service. But if you want him, if you want him, if you want him, you're in the right place. And it's not because I'm here. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. It's because he's here. He could do this without any of us. He'll show up. He showed up for those boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He was the fourth one in that furnace. They turned it up seven times hotter. It fried everybody on the outside that opposed them because what was in them burned brighter and hotter than what opposed them. Nebuchadnezzar ended up eating grass like an animal. He lost his mind. But those boys, they trusted their God. We will not bow down to your graven image, to the idol that you set up, that religious sacred cow that everything has to be five songs and five minutes of prayer and a 20-minute sermon and I'll see you next week. No transformation in that. No, no, no. God's looking for a people who will allow him in their surrender to light them up with fire. Because if you're burning, you don't care what anybody thinks. You take a little gasoline and you put it on somebody. And you did that. A little gasoline, a little light. A little, poof, poof, they would be going, ah! You wouldn't be going, ah! I wonder what Joe, Joe thinks about me screaming right now. <laughs> ah! <laughs> and then you wonder why people get bold. Well, they're on fire. <laughs> so Jesus shows up in that cabin on the river. Jesus comes in there. How many people know when Jesus shows up, you're not really thinking how many hummingbirds there are outside in the tree. 
Some people are trying to major on minutia. Jesus, the living king, wants to show up in your life. He's here right now. Sometimes we've got to throw away the clock and just go, you know what? If I'm with Jesus, I'm in a good place. And, you know, we get into this rhythm where it's like, God, I've been working so hard for you, I forgot to be with you. I just want to be with you. Because if I'm not with you, then what I do is in vain. I don't want righteousness that's filthy rags, that's gross. I want you, not religion. I want to know you intimately and personally and be so surrendered that you can surround and easily steer me as my navigator. You can't steer a parked car. You got to put it in drive. <laughs> put it in drive. You know, they didn't used to have power steering. It was hard to muscle those things, especially for a, a, a gal that didn't have as much strength. You know, you, you have to get the car moving before you could even steer it. Some of you are waiting for God to steer, but you're not even moving. I'm, just, I'm not condemning you. I'm just saying you got to get that thing in drive. <laughs> you know, the power of the Holy Ghost is like power steering. It's a lot easier to steer that baby when you got the Holy Ghost. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, it's kind of hard to steer. And you weren't meant to really steer anyway. Like, Jesus, take the wheel. I can't sing like her, but. Take it from my hands. I don't like this road I'm on. I'm letting go. See, I believe that's the secret to revival. I am so tired of programs. Trying to build a better ministry over here. And marriage is this. And children that. And teenage this. And high schoolers and college and let's do marriage ministry and let's do children ministry. We are a revival center. We're not supposed to have a whole bunch of programs. We're, we have one assignment and that's to let the king be the king in our gatherings. I just want Jesus. That's it. If you want a program, it might not be the right church for you, but I believe if you're here, you've been sent. And I believe this is a good place to be because Jesus is here and he's going to do something powerful. And we need a lot of help. We need workers that are willing. We need volunteers. There's a lot of things he's going to do, especially this year. This is our year of fulfillment to promises. So if you're here, I believe it's for a reason. And I believe also that, that God wants to encounter you on a daily basis. Don't wait to have to fly somewhere. Do you know when I was coming back on the, on the Uber ride home day before yesterday, um, the man that was in the car was playing some kind of like uh, reggae jumbo music. It was it was good. It was like, you know, bomb, 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 bomb. It made, made me kind of want to groove a little bit. And I'm in the backseat. I'm, I'm kind of tired. But I became aware that he was a Muslim. And I said, I said, hey, man, can you turn the radio down? I just want to talk to you for a minute. I didn't really want to talk to him. Honestly, I was having more fun just going boom, 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 boom. <laughs> I mean, you know. And so then I said, uh, I said, hey, man, do you know Jesus loves you? Uh, and then I knew that meant no. Well, he really loves you. Like he told me to tell you that he watches you and he delights in you. And I don't know if you know him, but he knows you and he loves you. And, you know, I could tell that he hadn't heard that before because he acted like he'd never heard that before. And his response I knew I was on track. I was supposed to tell him about the love of God. Do you know, after about 20 minutes of just telling him the truth of the word of God, just telling him the truth, all I did was I said, man, have you heard about the, the event that, that split time? Have you heard about that? No. Man, Jesus, you would call him Isu. In the Quran, it was Isu, right? But Jesus... Came to split time. He became our sin who knew no sin. So we would become the righteousness of God. And he didn't do that to condemn the world. He came that the world would be saved through this gift called salvation, which means to be saved, to be put in right relationship with God. You know, there's a lot of people who died for nothing. There's people who go up in the mountains and spend time by themselves for years, but nobody gets saved. Nobody gets healed. Nobody gets delivered, set free, put in right relationship, heaven bound, restored, filled. Muhammad didn't die for anyone. He didn't die for you, but Jesus did. 
Jesus died for your sin, and he did it because he loves you, not because you did all these things wrong and he thought, I better show him. No, he did it because it's the greatest act of love on the planet that he would lay his life down for who he calls a friend. He calls you friend, brother. He calls you friend. I didn't say, hey, man, you need to turn from that, and you need to repent, and you need to turn to Jesus. He would have just thought I was a nut, but instead... I shared with them the irresistible love of a living king. I said, he's not dead. He's alive. He rose again. We got to get this in our spirit. Jesus paid the highest price. There wasn't a higher price that you could pay. He sheds his own innocent blood so that we would be called his righteousness, so that we would be witnesses in all the land. I couldn't keep quiet. That guy's eternal future. This might be his only chance. What if he doesn't live to the next day? How am I going to feel that I didn't say anything about the hope that lies within me? I really believe that this is from the Spirit of God. He wants to convict you, not condemn you, so that your inaction would become your enemy. Some of you have been saying, I'm a Christian, but when God asks you to do it, you don't do it. You can't be a Christian because you have a fish sticker on the back of your car with no power steering. But you can be a Christian if you're following God. But you can't follow God if you don't hear him. So first know that you do hear if you're his and he's filled you with the spirit of God. And now that you know you hear, I don't care if the enemy tells you a thousand times you don't hear, you can't trust what you're hearing. Remember when you got it wrong? Jesus would never remind you of your past failure. He came to literally reconcile us based on his success, not our failure. So he paid the price, gave it to you. You have the keys of the kingdom of God. And we don't tell people about Jesus because we feel like we're going to go to hell because that has nothing to do with your salvation. It has everything to do with your response to the love of God. He tells me to go to North Carolina. He showed up in my room. Just like I read about Bobby Connor and I watched the video of him telling the story and he was in that cabin while he told the story. <laughs> What? Jesus knocking on the door. He barges in there, smashes a bottle against the wall, and starts talking to Bobby about being a witness. Starts talking to Bobby about the new wine. Starts talking to Bobby about the oil of the Holy Spirit. And he's just undone. And now I find myself, and I'm in that same room, in that same cabin, and I have an opportunity to just sit there and eat food for my natural body, or to be diving into the food of the spirit that is just so good. And I'm sitting in my room and I remember the last day. I'm like, Lord, I, 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 I've had such a great time encountering you and your powerful presence. And I just love you so much. And God, if you did nothing else for me, I would be a blessed man. And all of a sudden I look to the doorway and there's Jesus. And he's standing in the doorway. And I'm, I'm remembering that scripture it says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. That if you hear me and you open the door, that I'll come in and I'll sup with you. <laughs> I'm just like, that's Jesus in the door. And I'm seeing him by way of the spirit standing in the door, gazing at me with the love that pierces your soul. I'm just like, whoa, that's Jesus. And I can't even hardly talk. I'm just like, uh. And he began to talk to me. And I, I didn't want to lose what he was saying. So I, I got my phone and I pulled up my app really quick, my notes app. And I started typing down what he was saying. Man, I'd love to tell you what he said. Do you guys want to know? Yeah? yeah? yeah. Where's my phone? Where? Over here, my phone. Okay, I'll save it for another day. I prayed and I asked God for some of the oil that's been coming out of that Bible over in the Midwest. Has anybody heard about that? The guy, they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. And this Bible is kind of like this Bible here. This Bible started to, um, not this Bible, but, but his, this guy's Bible. And it started to, to, to leak oil. It just started to fill up inside. Supernaturally, oil began to pour from this man's Bible. Now, we've heard of miracles, signs, and wonders that follow those who believe in all of that. And this, these things, I believe they're going to happen here. 
I do. I believe that they're going to happen here. I've been praying for stuff, very specific things. Some of it has nothing to do with resource, although we always need that. But I was praying for stuff like this, just this little bottle of oil. I said, Lord, could I have a little bit of oil from that guy's Bible? I don't want to, I don't want to have to fly out there to get a little vial of it. Could you just have someone give it to me? So the Lord sets this up for me to go meet with Anna Roundtree. Does anybody know who Anna Roundtree is? She's written books. Uh, this is one of her books. I recommend it to you. Uh, this is called Heaven Awaits the Bride, Anna Roundtree. And I didn't know about her. I didn't know anything about her. In fact, uh, I told Terry, why don't you meet us up here in the cabin? He goes, where is it? I said, it's up on B B Prayer Mountain. And he goes, well, how will I find you? I said, I don't know. It doesn't have an address, the cabin. I just ask God. He'll direct you. He's like, what? I go, yeah, just pray. Just ask the Lord. He'll direct you. Okay, all right. And he's like, he leaves, you know. I'm like, you hear God. Just do what he says. So he comes up there in faith, and he gets pretty close, and he feels like he has to go knock on a certain door. So he pulls up, and, and he knocks on this door. And this lady comes out, and this sweet lady, and she says, can I help you? And he says, yeah, I'm, Nate, I'm, I'm, I'm Terry, and I'm, I'm looking for Nathan French. Do you happen to know where Nathan French is? He's from Seattle. He's, you know, an author, a speaker. You'd know Nathan. And the lady says, well, no, I'm sorry. I haven't, I haven't met Nathan, I don't think. Uh, and she says, uh, well, what, what, what does he look like? And he just begins to describe what I look like and whatever. And she goes, wait a minute. I know who you're talking about. He's staying down the road. On the right-hand side, on the river, in the little cabin down there. And Terry goes, oh, well, thank you. Well, gosh, who are you? And she says, I'm so-and-so, and I'm the assistant to Anna Roundtree. We have a scheduled meeting to meet with this woman of faith who has been a pioneer in that land for 50 years. People know who she is. She's on the hit list for all the witches in the area, and she's kicking booty. And she's doing warfare from the, from the mountaintop. And she writes books, and, and uh, it's hard. I guess it's really hard to get an appointment with her. And, and people come to her house. It's kind of strange. They knock on her door all day, and they can't answer because it, it would be impossible to function with everybody coming to the house all the time. So she has these little prayer meetings and invites certain people to come. And so we had this scheduled uh, luncheon planned with her so we could get some one-on-one -on -one time with her and, and talk to her. And uh, so here Terry comes down the road. And uh, I go, how'd you find us? He goes, well, I just went and knocked on this door. And have you heard of this lady, Anna Roundtree? Well, yeah, that's who we're meeting with tomorrow. He goes, well, they've already heard about you. <laughs> and the Lord said, see, I'm speaking about who you are in the land. I'm speaking. I'm going ahead of you to prepare your way. He goes, comes behind us to protect us as our rear guard. He goes ahead of us to set up the thing that he wants to do. And he always confirms what he's doing because he loves us. And I thought about this. I'm like, wow. So God designed for there to be an announcement made ahead of time so that it would change the way that I was received. And I believe that's what he wants to do with every one of us. Every one of us is special and unique. There's no one like you on the planet. And your value is so much more precious than gold or silver. Jesus is trying to announce the saints of God who he's sending on assignments for heaven. And I was blown away by that. And so we spent time with Terry. We went up on Prayer Mountain just praying and seeking the face of the Lord. And uh, Bob Jones had marked all these little portal spots where the angels were really moving up and down. And he would see them. And, and he'd put a stake. He'd say, put another one over there. And then, up oh, right over here, by this tree, right over here to the left. No more to the left over there. You know, Bob was a little abrasive, you know, the prophet Bob Jones. But anyway, my point in telling you the story is to encourage you to follow the Holy Spirit. And be consistent about it. Decide now what you're going to do then. I asked God for some oil from the Bible when I heard, do you know there's a basin, a big plastic basket basin, and it's full of oil, this much oil, and they have to keep giving the oil out around the nations of the earth because it continues to multiply. Because whatever you give away multiplies. Some of you are wondering why you don't have increase. It's because you forgot to give something away. 
I've been doing this for years with watches and cars and whatever. Whatever you give God, it, it was like things for like things. Give oil, you get oil in, increase. This Bible keeps pouring oil. I believe if they stop giving the oil out, it will dry up and there will be no more oil. The fish and the loaves only multiplied after he gave thanks and he began to pass it out. He broke it and he spread it out. It's like the oil. So I, I asked for this. I asked for this oil. Some people think, well, that's just a little bit of oil there. That's not a big deal. But guess what? The Holy Spirit is the most valuable asset that I have in my life. The anointing of the living God is priceless and there is nothing greater. We need to understand the value of the preciousness of who God is and what he has done for us so that we can fully access everything that he has for us. Because it's so much bigger than this earth. You're going to live forever. You have a chance to give him everything that you are on this earth so that he can give you everything that he is and everything that he has. He says, I give you the keys to my kingdom. What you allow will be allowed. What you do not allow will not be allowed. I got a stake from Bree. It's a stake that has all these scriptures on it for revival, repentance, cleansing of the land, purification, all these things. And I took that stake and I'm like, man, what do I do with this stake? And the Lord says, bring it to the church property and drive it in the ground and proclaim that the increase is now. But first, I want you to repent and confess for every sin that's been committed on this ground because I'm causing this ground to be sanctified and made holy because I'm going to bring a holy move of my mighty spirit. And you've been chosen for this. You might as well just tell your friends and family there's a move of God in town and you can come. <laughs> if you don't tell them, they might not find out. But I'm excited for my whole family to be on fire for God. Some of my family members are resisting the Holy Spirit, but I pray for them. And I believe God's doing a mighty work. I don't try to get them to do something. I love them and I speak truth in love. And I continue to pray and show them by example how to not respond in anger and how to love the hell out of people who don't deserve it. Hell's in the Bible. I read it in its real place. And I don't want that to be my address. So I decided I'm going to do what God says. I'm going to give up my life so I can find it. I'm going to walk in the spirit. I'm going to carry the anointing. And if it puts me on the ground for a few hours or even a few days, it was worth it. Because I'm going to get up every time under the resurrection power of the living God. And I'm going to move heaven on earth because Jesus is the king of all the kings. Come on, do you believe it? Come on, stand to your feet. Let's conclude the gathering. But I just want to pray for you. Father, we ask right now, in the mighty name of Jesus, that you would do something so powerful in our city. Lord, that you would cleanse the ground. That you would redeem your people and even restore lost time. Bring unification in the bride, God. We cry out to you for this. We ask you, God, to do a mighty work among us. Lord, we pray that everything we need for Awaken the Planet, that it would come forth with precision. That it would be paid for before we step in the building. We ask God that you would bring forth the right speaker combination and the right worship teams that you want to be a part of the awakening for the Northwest. We're asking God that everything that's needed for it to be exactly what you want it to be to come forth now in Jesus name. And we thank you in advance for what you will be faithful to do as we do our part. We know you'll do yours. Come on. Say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Bless you.